1. Don't dwell on past glories. Someone once said that living in the past glory is the biggest obstacle to the future. Everyone has a past, a time of youthful triumph, but after all, it's just the past. Many people don't understand this, using their past to define their present life. Seeing others who were less successful in the past now doing better than themselves, they feel it's unjust to make an effort to catch up. How could someone who was once poor be doing so well now? As others advance step by step, these individuals cling to the past, believing themselves to be smart yet finding themselves increasingly left behind, their lives stagnating. Those who immerse themselves in past successes without moving on may feel they are genuinely talented but unlucky, believing life deliberately places obstacles in their way. This mindset breeds resentment and dissatisfaction, making everything seem disagreeable. Yesterday cannot stay, and the same goes for past glories. If we pay no mind to the glory of the past, we won't halt our progress, won't harbor discontent with life, and step by step, life will beautifully progress. 2. The Money-Hungry Man during the era of the Han and Chu rivalries, there was a man consumed by greed. Despite his poor circumstances, thoughts of acquiring wealth constantly filled his mind. One day, he spotted a shop selling small gold statues, a place frequented by the town's affluent. Unable to resist his desires, he decided to steal one. He dressed neatly and pretended to browse the town's shops. Spotting a gold statue on display, he swiftly grabbed it and fled. However, the guards noticed and quickly apprehended him. When asked why he dared to steal in broad daylight with many witnesses, the man simply said he hadn't noticed anyone around him. This story teaches us that greed can blind us, making us lose basic awareness and rational thought. The man was so fixated on the gold statue that he failed to consider the risks of his actions. Similarly, in life, some people become so obsessed with wealth and status that everything else, including their existing happiness, fades into the background, unnoticed. 3. Illness from a Snake Illusion In the Jin Dynasty era, there was a man named Le Guang, one day, he invited a friend over to his house. Upon his friend's arrival, Guang noticed that his friend looked unwell. When asked about his condition, the friend explained that he had been feeling ill since the last time he attended a party at Guang's house. That day, he had drunk wine from a cup that appeared to have a small snake inside it. Because of this, he had been severely ill and bedridden. Le Guang was perplexed wondering how it was possible for a snake to be in his friend's wine glass. He scanned the room and spotted a bow with a snake design hung on the wall, which led him to realize the cause of the misunderstanding. Guang then poured wine into a cup and asked his friend to stand at the same spot as during the party, then to look into the cup to see if there was a snake. The friend saw the reflection of the snake from the bow and was adamant there was one. Guang smiled, removed the bow from the wall, and suddenly, to his friend's astonishment, the snake disappeared. The friend then understood that there had never been a snake in his wine. It was merely his imagination influenced by the reflection. Once his fear was dispelled, he quickly recovered. This story serves as a reminder not to be overly suspicious about unnecessary things, we should think logically and carefully consider our assumptions before jumping to conclusions. Otherwise, we might end up facing a lot of trouble over things that don't even exist. 4. The Young Monk's Insight During the Tang Dynasty at Mount Wutai, there was a renowned Zen master named Ma Zhu, known for his unconventional teaching methods, often involving challenging his disciples. One day, to impart a lesson, he chose to use this approach with a young disciple. Mazu placed a chair on the narrow path behind the temple to read, obstructing the way. Soon after, a young monk came along, 
pushing a cart from the vegetable garden back to the temple. The path was too narrow to pass because Ma Zhu was stretching his legs across it, so the young monk respectfully asked him to move his legs. Surprisingly, Ma Zhu did not retract his legs but instead declared, My legs are always stretched out and never drawn back. The young monk was taken aback and slightly troubled, stating, If Master does not move his legs, I cannot return to the temple. Ma Zhu, without even glancing at the young monk, simply stated, That's your problem. After pondering for a moment, the young monk proposed, Master, since you only stretch out and never retract, I cannot pass. Let us switch places. I will sit on the chair and you push the cart. Intrigued by this, Ma Zhu agreed to switch positions. The young monk then mimicked stretching his legs out straight, but when Ma Zhu pushed the cart towards him, the young monk quickly pulled his legs back. Ma Zhu asked, Why did you retract your legs? The young monk replied with a smile, Master is the one who only stretches out and never retracts, but I can do both, so I pulled my legs back. Following this, the young monk pushed the cart away, leaving Ma Zhu watching his disciples' departing figure with a satisfied smile. Years later, Ma Zhu passed on his robe and bowl to this young monk, who later became a renowned abbot at Mount Wutai, known as Zen Master and Feng. The Story of the Donkey Carrying Sacred Objects This is a fable by the French writer La Fontaine, one of his signature works. It tells of a donkey that was sent by a priest to carry sacred objects one day. Seeing the devotees worshipping, the donkey felt a sense of pride. The next day, when the priest sent it to pull a millstone, the donkey, still basking in the previous day's nobility, refused to obey and was beaten by its owner, leading it to cry out. A ten-year-old child, upon hearing this story, remarked, Don't forget, you are just a donkey. Indeed, many donkeys in the world confuse themselves with sacred objects. They become arrogant with power and despondent without it, boastful in position and deflated upon losing it. A donkey remains a donkey, and sacred objects remain sacred. Even a child understands this simple truth, so why do adults remain deluded? Carrying sacred objects like opium can be addictive. No matter how long the donkey carries them, there will come a day when they must be put down, just like people who doesn't want to live gloriously. Being worshipped from all directions brings not just spiritual joy but also provides for physical needs and even wealth. However, this is no different from the donkey carrying sacred objects, mistaking the luxury for its own, eventually becoming accustomed to it and fearing loss, leading to a miserable existence. In reality, it's one's physique, interests, skills, personality, and thoughts that truly accompany one's life. The days of carrying sacred objects are merely fleeting moments in the tumultuous journey of life. 5. Your Friend's Spouse Look away, don't touch. Your friend's wife should not be ogled. Your friend's husband should not be touched. This proverb handed down by our ancestors serves as a reminder to future generations that whether you are married or single, you should not gaze upon or become overly familiar with someone else's partner. Observing decorum and maintaining boundaries is a critical aspect of personal ethics. In Chapter 80 of Journey to the West, it's recounted that Sun Wukong and his disciples needed to borrow Princess Iron Fan's banana fan to cross the Flame Mountain. Sun Wukong, confident due to his sworn brotherhood with the bull demon king, approached his sister-in-law to borrow the fan, only to be scolded by the bull demon king for attempting to deceive his wife previously. This led to the saying, Do not oppress your friend's wife, which has since been widely known. However, the full saying includes a lesser-known second part. Your friend's wife should not be oppressed, ogled. The phrase, a friend's wife is not to be coveted is directed at men, meaning beyond not bullying or deceiving your friend's wife, oppressing also implies coveting. 
This concept has been passed down through generations, as being overly close to your friend's wife can cause gossip and strain both friendships and the marital relationship. During the Song Dynasty, Liu Qi and Zhang Jiang were close brothers until Zhang developed feelings for Liu's wife, Huang Mai. An incident at a restaurant allowed Liu to subtly address the situation, leading Zhang to realize his mistake. Despite societal changes, the principle of not coveting your friend's wife remains a moral imperative. Your friend's husband should not be touched. The continuation of your friend's wife should not be oppressed is less known. Your friend's husband should not be touched. This message, aimed at women, also advocates for maintaining distance from your friend's husband. Ancient teachings emphasize that direct contact between men and women was inappropriate unless facilitated by a third party. Today, some women not only desire their friend's husband but also actively pursue them, leading to dramatic consequences as depicted in modern dramas like Affairs of the Heart. Such stories, sadly, are not just fiction but reflect real-life situations. Therefore, respecting the sanctity of marriage and maintaining appropriate boundaries with the opposite sex is essential, regardless of your gender. 6. The wise don't boast about four things. The wisdom of not flaunting wealth, according to Journey to the West. In Journey to the West, regarded as an Enlightenment book by Truong Trieu during the Qing Dynasty, the story seemingly narrates the adventures of Tong Sanzong and his disciples facing demons and spirits on their quest to fetch Buddhist scriptures from the West. However, it metaphorically interprets the essence of human life, embedding wisdom in dealing with others through each character and trial. After reading Journey to the West, we come to understand that those of higher wisdom never boast about four things. 1. Not flaunting wealth As Tang Sanzang and his disciples passed through a monastery, they were generously hosted by Elder Kim Tri, who assumed Tang Sanzang, coming from a prosperous country, must possess rare treasures. Tang Sanzang, being humble, would never show off any treasures, even if he had any. Unlike him, Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, enjoyed boasting and seeking trouble. Seeing Elder Kim Tree's arrogance, Wukong provoked Tang Sanzang to display the splendid cassock given by Buddha. Tang Sanzang promptly refused, advising against competing in wealth, fearing trouble due to their lack of local support. Ignoring Tang Sanzang's advice, Wukong's actions stirred Elder Kim Tree's greed, leading to unnecessary complications and even attracting a demonic bear causing much trouble. The saying, guests do not part with their belongings and wealth should not be flaunted, emphasizes that flaunting wealth only breeds envy and desire in others. A person of rich inner life feels no need to display their material wealth outwardly. The Tale of Stone Sung A similar story from the Western Jin Dynasty involves Stone Sung, a man who enjoyed expressing his wealth in unique ways. He once competed with Wang Kai to see who was wealthier. Wang Kai washed pots with syrup while Stone Sung used candles instead of wood for cooking. Wang Kai painted walls with red lacquer while Stone Sung used precious peppercorns for paint. Although Stone Sung outdid Wang Kai, his extravagant display attracted the attention of those with malicious intent. Eventually, Zhao Wang Tu Ma Luan, holding power in the court, and his confidant Ton Tu, coveting Stone Sung's wealth, falsely accused him of treason. Stone Sung and his family were executed, and their wealth seized by Ton Tu, ending in a tragic loss of life and fortune. It said, ignorance and wealth in the same place make one more likely to fall. Satisfying temporary vanity by flaunting wealth is the greatest folly. Boasting about riches does not earn genuine respect from others but exposes the emptiness of one's spirit. 2. The Virtue of Humility in Strength 
Sun Wukong, ever since he became a disciple of Bodhi, devoted himself to mastering new skills. Swiftly, he learned the art of cloud somersaulting and the 72 transformations. Once, while practicing alone, his fellow disciples eagerly urged Sun Wukong to showcase his magical abilities for all to see. Given his penchant for stirring up trouble, he complied, performing feats of transformation and cloud riding before the crowd. Bodhi, upon learning of this, reprimanded Sun Wukong. Why flaunt your abilities? If you possess something others desire, they'll want it too. If you're unwilling to share when asked, you may invite trouble or even endanger your own life. Despite repeated apologies, Sun Wukong's behavior didn't change. Later, during his upheaval in heaven, he boasted of his powers in front of the Buddha, failing to recognize that there are always greater heights to achieve. This arrogance led to his own downfall, as he was eventually trapped under the Five Elements Mountain. The Taigan Lun speaks to this, noting, The eagle stands as if asleep, the tiger walks as if ill. These are their strategies for capturing prey. Thus, the wise keep their talents hidden, reserving their strength for when it's truly needed. True strength is never ostentatious. It quietly accumulates power. No matter how exceptional one might be, it's crucial to assess situations with humility and keep one's talents concealed. During the Warring States period, King Wu of Qin, a monarch of unparalleled valor and ambition, expanded his kingdom's power through continuous conquests. However, his demise came from a moment of hubris. During a visit to the Chu capital, he engaged in a strength competition, lifting a heavy tripod without heeding warnings. Overexerting himself, he suffered grave injuries and died at the young age of 23, a time when most are just beginning to pursue their life's ambitions. The I Ching advises, The noble man conceals his talents, waiting for the right moment to reveal them. It's admirable to possess great abilities, but flaunting them can invite unintended consequences. Keep your flaws hidden and refrain from boasting about your talents. When you show off your abilities to others, you diminish your own worth. 3. Refrain from boasting about intelligence. The wisest among the disciples was Sha Wu Jing. Sha Wu Jing gave the impression of being gentle and honest. Yet in reality, he possessed a keen mind and a profound understanding of interpersonal relations. However, Sha Wu Jing knew the virtue of humility and never boasted about his intelligence in front of others. He only stepped forward to speak at critical moments. In the episode, Three Attempts to Steal the Bone Essence, when Master Tang reprimanded Sun Wukong, Sha Wu Jing did not utter a word to plead for mercy nor did he speak up to retain Wukong when he was dismissed. Throughout, he remained detached, always upholding a dignified demeanor. Later, when battling the demon Huang Pao, Sha Wu Jing was captured, and Zhu Bajie reluctantly sought Sun Wukong's help. When Wukong reproached Sha Wu Jing, asking, Why didn't you plead for my forgiveness? Sha Wu Jing simply replied with six words, a gentleman does not dwell on the past. This brief statement not only elevated Sun Wukong, but also showed Sha Wu Jing's remorse, easily resolving the tension between them. It was Sha Wu Jing's ability to assess situations and handle them adeptly, without showing off, that earned him Master Tang's trust and affection. The Great Root discussion suggests hide your skill in clumsiness, use darkness wisely. Conceal clarity in chaos, straighten through bending. The truly intelligent know how to conceal their wisdom. Revealing one's intelligence too openly may ultimately lead to accomplishing nothing. As the saying goes, a person of talent may appear foolish, carrying a bucket and running clumsily. Those genuinely smart often play the fool at the right moment. 4. Do not boast about achievements. 
When Sun Wukong wreaked havoc in heaven, a hundred thousand heavenly soldiers could not subdue him until Guan Yin Bodhisattva recommended Erlang Shen to the Jade Emperor. With the assistance of the primeval lord, Erlang Shen successfully captured Sun Wukong, earning the Jade Emperor's respect. However, when the Jade Emperor commended the victory, Erlang Shen remained calm attributing the success to Guan Yin Bodhisattva and the primeval lord, sharing his rewards with his subordinates. After thanking the Jade Emperor, he returned to seclusion at Guangku. Tang Kwok Fien said, Misfortune comes from one's actions. Credit should first go to others. Sharing credit and leading in adversity are foundational to success. The more humble one is, the more willing they are to forego personal gains for collective success, often reaping greater benefits than the immediate rewards. Laozi said, Be born without possession, achieve without attachment. Effort without self-praise and achievement without arrogance define true character. Talent may invite arrogance, but profound wisdom lies in concealment. Success without conceit and willingness to share credit pave a broad path ahead. Kwai Kok Tu stated, The way of the sage is in concealment. Bodhidharma also warned Sun Wukong, Fame is gained by daily hardship. Failure often comes at moments of satisfaction. Vanity is the manifestation of evil, while humility harbors goodness. Overboasting is merely a display of emptiness, only by remaining concealed can one endure. 7. Embrace effort and difficulties. Become manageable. Avoid effort and even simple tasks. Become difficult. This phrase is excerpted from the renowned book Weishu Yizhuzi, shortened as Weishu, authored by Pan Zhenyu of the Qing Dynasty. The original text states, is there really a distinction between difficult and easy tasks in the world? If one is willing to put in the effort, then what seems difficult can become easy. If one refuses to try, then even easy tasks can become difficult. Pan Zhenyu illustrates this point with a story from a remote region in Shu involving two monks, one poor, the other wealthy. The poor monk expressed a desire to travel to the southern seas, to which the wealthy monk questioned, What means do you have to undertake such a journey? The poor monk replied, I only need a flask and a bowl. The wealthy monk retorted, I have wanted to hire a boat to sail there with the current for many years without success. How do you propose to get there? A year later, the poor monk returned from the southern seas and shared his experiences with the wealthy monk, who was visibly ashamed. Despite the distance of thousands of miles from Shu to the southern seas, the poor monk managed to reach his destination, while the wealthy monk did not. This story underscores the idea that a person with determination seeking enlightenment can achieve their goals, regardless of their origins. 8. Strength in Solitude According to Zhuangzi, the ultimate state of being is coming alone and going alone. Those who reach this realm are akin to unmatched masters, retreating into seclusion for self-improvement before emerging invincible. Solitude is about channeling all your energy to overcome weaknesses, marking the beginning of true strength. Zhuangzi writes in Journey to the North, the vast and beautiful heavens and earth do not speak. The four seasons follow their laws without debate, and all things hold their truths without showing off. The universe indeed harbors profound truths, quietly and effortlessly, in contrast to those restless hearts that constantly seek noise and commotion. In this world, solitude is inevitable. We are born alone and die alone. Today we gather, and tomorrow we part with no one to accompany us forever. Conversing with others may relieve loneliness momentarily, but it doesn't cure it. The more you speak, the emptier you may feel. Silence brings solitude back. Some things are better digested alone. 
as sharing might turn them into ridicule. Don't squander the time meant for solitude. It's in silence and fearlessness alone that one can truly grasp life's transformative powers. Some say that only by crossing the desolate Gobi can one find a refreshing stream. Life's long journey is a solo endeavor. Idle talk is no substitute for a serene heart. Solitude allows for self-reflection. It's said that crowds may harbor loneliness while the solitary find freedom. In solitude, one encounters their true self, liberating their inner spirit. Those who socialize are often searching, yet few find genuine companionship. The solitary may seem indifferent, but are, in fact, deeply self-aware and their own best friend. Solitude also gives us the time to focus on ourselves and do what we truly want, finding comfort and freedom in being alone. Superficial interactions can be exhausting. Bending to others' wills diminishes us. Life is precious, so don't let idle chatter waste your valuable time. True solitude means avoiding external interference, maintaining inner freedom. Solitude is about self-strengthening. The saying goes, either be solitary or be mediocre. Those who stand on their own endure all storms. Don't fear hardship. What doesn't defeat you strengthens you. Behind every success are solitary struggles, pains, and tears. Learn to withstand solitude, making it a habit like the eagle, or follow the crowd for safety. After a period of solitary refinement, one spirit can become steadfast and enlightened. Then your approach to life becomes strategic, swift as the wind, steady as a forest, aggressive as fire, immovable as a mountain, inscrutable as the night, and thunderous as thunder. Those who walk alone are formidable. Such individuals rarely fail later in life. Solitude is the best way to fortify oneself. Historically, sages preferred solitude, and the truly strong were often lone wanderers. Solitude allows us to introspect, escape societal hustle, and find peace. It makes us resilient, independent of others' strength or opinions. So cherish your moments of solitude, be true to yourself, and achieve personal greatness within life's finite span. 9. The Path to Enlightenment Through Mindfulness In ancient times there were two mountains, one facing north and the other south, each with a temple on its peak. To distinguish them, people referred to them as the North Temple and the South Temple. Every morning, a young monk from each temple would descend to the market to buy vegetables. These young monks, still unrefined and full of youthful vigor, often found themselves in rivalry. Whenever they met at the market, they would engage in subtle or sometimes overt contests of wit. One day, the monk from the South Temple asked, Where are you heading? The monk from the North Temple replied, Wherever my feet take me, I shall go. Confounded and unable to retort, the monk from the South Temple returned to his temple, frustrated, to consult his master. The abbot of the South Temple, rather than advising the young monk to cultivate his mind and avoid petty conflicts, suggested a comeback for the next encounter. Next time, ask him where he would go if he had no feet. That will surely best him. The following morning, the two young monks met again. The South Temple monk repeated his question, but this time the North Temple monk said, I go wherever the wind takes me. Again, the South Temple monk was left speechless and upset. Upon his return, he recounted the exchange to his master, who then suggested a new retort, ask him where he would go if there were no wind. Emboldened, the South Temple monk approached the North Temple monk the next day, ready to silence him. But this time, the North Temple monk simply said, I'm going to the market. The South Temple monk was once again left without a comeback, as it would be absurd to ask, where would you go if there were no market? Reflecting on this, the abbot sighed and shared a wisdom. From the sunset, we learn the impermanence of life. From the white clouds, 
the ease of their drift, from the mountains, the marvel of nature, from the oceans, their vast expanse. True learning lies in mindfulness and personal realization. It cannot be attained through others. What belongs to others will always remain theirs. Only what you discover for yourself truly becomes your own. This tale underscores the importance of mindfulness and self-discovery on the path to enlightenment, teaching us that wisdom cannot be won through competition or reliance on others, but through personal growth and understanding. 10. The Three Magical Doors In life, facing countless frustrations, differences, and flaws in others or even in ourselves can sometimes lead to irritation and discomfort. How can we maintain a peaceful and forgiving mindset? The following three teachings from the Buddha provide an answer. Once, a prince asked his mentor, Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, what will my future path in life be like? The Buddha responded, on your journey through life, you will encounter three doors. Each door bears a message, and when you see them, you will understand. After you pass through the third door, I will meet you on the other side. So, the prince set off on his journey. Before long, he came across the first door, which read, Change the world. The prince thought, I must use my ideals to change the world, to alter all that I see as wrong and he attempted to do just that. Years later, the prince encountered the second door, which read, Change Others. He thought, I should use my positive beliefs to enlighten others, to improve their characters towards greater righteousness. And so, he acted accordingly. Several years passed, and he reached the third door, which read, Change Yourself. The prince reflected, I need to perfect my own character first. And that's what he did. Eventually, the prince reunited with Buddha Siddhartha Gautama and shared his experiences, saying, I have passed through the three doors on my life's path and have seen the teachings written on each one. I've realized that changing the world is less important than changing the people in it, and changing others is less important than changing oneself. The Buddha smiled at this revelation and suggested, Perhaps now you should return and take a closer look at those doors. Following the Buddha's advice, the prince went back and from a distance saw the third door again. However, this time it appeared different. The message on the door read, Accept yourself. It was then he understood why, despite his efforts to change himself, he always felt self-critical and troubled. It was because he had refused to accept and embrace his own flaws, always focusing on what he couldn't do, thus overlooking his own strengths. So he began to learn to love and accept himself. Continuing his return journey, he saw the second door again, now reading, Accept Others. He then realized why he had always been so frustrated and annoyed, because he hadn't accepted the differences and shortcomings of others without judgment or empathy. So, he started to practice tolerance towards others. As he approached the first door once more, it read, Accept the world. Only then did he understand why his attempts to change the world had always failed, because he hadn't accepted the reality that many things in the world won't go as planned. He had always tried to force others to conform to his will, neglecting his own personal growth. Thus, he began to embrace the world with an open and generous heart. The Buddha Siddhartha Gautama was waiting for him and said, I think now you understand what peace and tranquility truly mean. The story of the three doors teaches us that living in this world, we should recognize our own strengths and weaknesses, continuously strive for self-improvement to become noble and forgiving individuals. We should be open-hearted and empathetic towards others, always thinking from their perspective, fostering good relations without harboring animosity. Only then can we live harmoniously with others and truly contribute to society. 11. Zhang Ziya, Three Key Lessons for Life There's a saying, 
To be ignorant of Zheng Tai Gong is to waste your time reading history. Indeed, Zheng Zia was a real historical figure. While he may not have had the magical powers attributed to him in the investiture of the gods, he truly embodied the adage, it's never too late to succeed. If there were a ranking for late bloomers achieving greatness, Zhang Zia would be second to none. In his early years, he faced many hardships and lived in obscurity by the Wei River until his 70s. Yet, as the saying goes, Zhang Taigong fishes, and those who wish will bite. Zhang Zia, then over 80, was sought out by King Wen of Zhou, who was in search of wise men, finally giving Zhang a platform to showcase his talents. From then on, he assisted King Wen and King Wu of Zhou, achieving great feats that would immortalize his name. Jiang Zia's life experience teaches us that success isn't about timing, but hinges on three critical points. 1. The ability to endure solitude. The poet Li Bai once said, since ancient times, the sage has been alone. This perfectly describes Zhang Zia. After the fall of the Shang dynasty, he retreated to live in seclusion by the Wei River until he was 80, when King Wen invited him to leave his solitary life. During this period of seclusion, he spent at least two years and four months alone. To the outside world, Zhang Zia appeared as a mere old man, unremarkable and seemingly unintelligent for who fishes with a straight hook. However, unknown to all, this useless old man was incredibly patient, a virtue he demonstrated through his fishing. He was also well-versed in literature and military strategies. During his years of solitude, although lonely, Zhang Zia never idled. Instead, he continually charged his batteries, preparing for the moment he would emerge and make a significant impact. Modern observations have also revealed that successful people often handle solitude better than those who don't succeed. Those who can withstand being alone usually have grand ambitions and lofty ideals. They have clear thinking and continuously enrich their knowledge to achieve their goals. Thus, when the opportunity arises, they can fully demonstrate their talents, seize the moment without hesitation, and shine on their stage. Zhang Zia once said, Only by enduring solitude can we have the capacity to embrace prosperity and welcome abundance. A touch of folly. A dash of madness. There's no fame without a touch of folly, no achievement without a dash of madness. This idea, originating from Jiang Zia's Qi Fu, suggests that a little foolishness and madness can be beneficial. Being foolish means being steadfast in your beliefs, striving for what you love, and persisting towards your goals with hard work. Never forgetting one's focus ensures that one's talents will surely make waves. The madness is about holding on to the belief in one's dreams and pursuing personal talents, as confidence is the ultimate secret to success. It's said, everyone chasing a dream has their foolish and mad points, and every successful person has their unique brand of craziness. Truly, those who seem foolish or mad often have a deep-seated belief that shields them from the scrutiny of others. Take Zhang Zia, for instance. While others used curved hooks for fishing, Duke Tai used a straight hook. Many thought him foolish. Yet, when mocked, he simply smiled, for he wasn't fishing for fish. He believed his true aim would take the bait. Wasn't he mad to believe so? This embodies the idea that others laugh at me for being mad, but I laugh at them for not seeing the truth. Therefore, to succeed, one should be three parts foolish and seven parts mad. Such individuals are often closest to success. 2. Choose your words wisely. Sometimes it's best to hold your tongue and choose your words carefully. This famous quote from Jiang Zia in Tai Gong Jin Kui, advised to King Zhuang of Chu, 
has been passed down through generations. It means that one should be cautious with their words. Throughout history, successful individuals have placed great importance on the art of speaking, with Confucius himself stating, be cautious with your words and sensitive and intelligent in your actions. The saying, disaster comes from the mouth, warns that careless speech can not only hurt others, but bring trouble upon oneself. Thus, those with cultivation refrain from speaking recklessly or without basis. They think carefully, pay attention, exercise restraint, and do not speak incessantly. They do not indulge or boast about themselves. The wise speak with their minds, not just their mouths. Before speaking, consider what should and should not be said, when to speak, and how to say it. Remember, Every word you utter can either build you up or bring you down. Just as you wouldn't eat indiscriminately, you shouldn't speak without thought. In life, it's essential to retract sharp words that can wound others and maintain a standard for personal conduct. This is a crucial rule for interacting with everyone. 12. The Head of a Man the feet of a woman, seen, not touched. In folklore, proverbs are often passed down through generations, representing the wisdom of our ancestors and the lessons learned from their everyday lives. While they may not possess the elegance of poetry or prose, these sayings have endured for thousands of years and are quietly revered for their profound insights. The saying, the head of a man, the feet of a woman, seen, not touched, encapsulates a deep cultural respect for personal boundaries. Historically, men wore their hair long and women bound their feet, making both these features significant yet somewhat off-limits. Touching a man's head, an act reserved for close family or elders, was considered disrespectful and demeaning by others. The head, often covered by a hat, symbolized one's social status and dignity, making it inappropriate to touch casually. Similarly, a woman's feet, especially during the era of foot binding, were considered private and were not to be exposed or touched by others. This practice reflected the beauty standards of the time, though it eventually became obsolete. Even today, women take great care of their feet, using various skin care products to maintain their appearance, highlighting the ongoing importance of this part of the body. Additionally, some believe that the head of a man, the feet of a woman, and the waist hold significant positive energy or luck within the body, and touching these areas could result in the loss of such energy. Therefore, being allowed to touch a man's head or a woman's feet indicates a close and trusted relationship. However, this was traditionally seen as inappropriate due to strict gender norms regarding physical interaction. With societal evolution, modern attitudes towards gender interactions have become more relaxed. Nowadays, it's common for men and women to have physical contact like patting on the back, touching faces, or hugging among friends. Yet, in public or formal settings, the principle of men not touching heads, women not touching feet, remains a social taboo in many cultures, cautioning against actions that might be perceived as disrespectful or invasive. 13. The Fear of Idleness in Life The pursuit of excellence is a fundamental aspect of human life, making it crucial not to fall into the trap of idleness. The renowned Chinese author Shen Kongwen once expressed, My greatest fear in life is to find myself idle and lose the meaning of life. His student, Wang Zhengqi, depicted Shen in an article as a man who, even in the cold of winter without a fire to keep warm, would wrap himself in a quilt and continue writing. In his later years, Shen refused to spend his time resting. Instead, he compiled... Studies on ancient Chinese costumes, drawing from extensive documents and research. He was always writing, even when others were indulging in leisure, 
and he continued to write even in the face of criticism and questioning. Embracing busyness as the norm in life is the only way to truly understand its value. Fourteen, idle hands. Invite melancholy. Laziness breeds illness. Keeping oneself busy isn't as frowned upon as some might suggest. In fact, it's often seen as a blessing from above. Climbing ten steps without breaking a sweat may be challenging for the youth, but 91-year-old Li Xiao Lo accomplishes this with ease. His secret to maintaining robust health is simple. Never allow yourself to be idle. Every morning, Li rises at 7 a.m., follows an hour of exercise with breakfast at 8, takes a walk, then settles down with the newspaper by 9.30. His afternoons are filled with music, calligraphy, another hour of exercise, and helping his wife with household chores. There's a saying, idle hands invite melancholy, laziness breeds illness, but a busy life brings joy. This holds true as idleness can torment both mind and body, leading to negative thoughts and self-blame. Physical laziness, on the other hand, deteriorates our health and leads to self-loathing. Conversely, staying busy is the elixir of life, historically being the gateway to a vibrant existence. Kazuo Ishiguro, a Japanese author, once reflected on his life, believing that dedicating his years to capturing the world's unique beauties was time well spent, leaving no room for regrets about wasted time. Then there's the inspiring tale of a group of Taiwanese seniors, averaging 81 years old, who touched many hearts by motorcycling around Taiwan. They journeyed from north to south day to night, circling the island in 13 days. Among them, two battled cancer, four needed hearing aids, eight suffered from heart conditions, and all faced joint degeneration. Their adventure was a testament that age is but a number, and one can choose to live vibrantly in their twilight years rather than in the confines of a hospital. Life is inherently filled with challenges, yet given another chance, many would still opt for a life brimming with energy. After all, it's through such experiences that the true value of life is discovered. 15. The Way of Balance The saying goes, Hard objects are easily broken. Soft objects are easily bent. Only those that embody balance are invincible. The Book of Rights, the Doctrine of the Mean, states, Before joy, anger, sorrow, and pleasure are expressed, they are in a state of equilibrium. When they are expressed but regulated, they are in harmony. Equilibrium is the ultimate nature of things. Harmony is the universal path everyone should follow. Achieving equilibrium and harmony ensures peace in the world and flourishing of all things. The Analects of Confucius in the section Yang Ye mentions, The virtue of moderation is truly noble, and its essence is rare. This suggests that embracing moderation as a virtue for self-cultivation leads to a higher realm of existence. The principle of moderation is significant, advocating for a balanced and neutral stance in interactions without leaning too far in any direction. The essence of moderation teaches us that everything follows a measure. The ancients advised, the rigid are easily broken, the flexible are easily bent, implying that one should navigate between rigidity and flexibility. Measure is the inherent rule of things. Aligning with this rule enables smooth sailing, whereas deviation leads to obstacles. Wisdom teaches that excessive ego or the absence of self-identity is pitiable. Those with an inflated ego become blind with confidence, leading to arrogance and stubbornness, considering no one else's perspective and becoming self-centered, which can result in a life filled with dissatisfaction. On the other hand, those without self-restraint are overly self-doubting, constantly conforming to others' opinions, 
overly concerned with others' perceptions, leading a life for others, and exhaust themselves in the process. Thus, those who exceed their limits or fail to control themselves cannot see the truth of matters. They are blinded by their own perspective, unable to appreciate the genuine nature of things, believing that their own truths are the only truths. Meanwhile, those without self-restraint swing to another extreme, surrendering their ability to think and reason, believing whatever they are told without discernment. In human relationships, being too distant can lead to longing and distress, while being too close can breed contempt and endless conflicts. Hence the saying, distance makes the heart grow fonder, but too close for comfort leads to strife. The ideal is to find the right balance, embodying the beauty of equilibrium and harmony. In essence, the principle of balance applies to all aspects of life. When cooking, too much or too little salt can ruin a dish. Too little leads to blandness, too much to inedibility. With food, longing comes from deprivation while excess leads to satiety. In sleep, too little leaves one drained, while too much causes physical discomfort and mental fatigue. In life, being overly busy can make one lose sight of life's purpose and joy, while too much leisure can render life tasteless, unable to grasp its true essence. If one can maintain a balanced approach in interactions, regulate their inner state, and achieve joy without indulgence and sorrow without despair, free from external influences and self-centered grief, only then can one truly appreciate the beauty of equilibrium and harmony. 16. Integrity comes first in interactions. In the United States, relationships often start with trust in one's character. No matter how skilled a person might be, without the ability to inspire trust in their character, achieving significant success remains a challenge. There was a large company in need of an accounting assistant. Candidates were interviewed and screened by the HHR specialist daily. After several rounds, only three candidates remained, all nearly equal in ability, leaving the HR specialist undecided and seeking the owner's advice. The owner asked them a simple question. How would you help the company evade $500,000 in taxes? The first two candidates suggested creating fake accounts. The owner nodded but remained non-committal, asking them to wait for further notice. When it was the last candidate's turn, a young woman, she hesitated, then asked, is that absolutely necessary? The owner nodded. The woman then politely excused herself from the interview. Suddenly, the owner stood, smiled at her, and said, Please wait. You are the most honest and principled among the candidates. Congratulations, you've passed the interview. Over time, this young woman was promoted to a respected chief accounting inspector. The Book of Rights mentions virtue brings success, meaning those with virtue will indeed find success. Character is the most effective way to test someone's integrity, serving as the ultimate boundary in basic human interactions. There's an interesting fable about God having a scale that measures the weight of one's character. On one side, a standard weight. Those heavier are deemed of high character, while those lighter are considered of low character. Once, a poor man, wearing nothing, stepped on the scale and exceeded the standard weight, earning God's praise as a person of high character. A wealthy man, fearing he wouldn't weigh enough and be deemed of low character, strapped a thick gold belt around his waist and confidently stepped on the scale. Indeed, he was heavier than the standard weight, but God shook his head, saying, You are of low character. The wealthy man protested, arguing the scale was inaccurate, questioning how he, adorned with jewels, could weigh less than the poor man. God explained, This scale doesn't measure wealth but character. Without the gold, your bones weigh almost nothing compared to the poor man's. The most valuable asset in life isn't wealth, but being a person of integrity. Good character is the best business card, 
and the finest fortune one can have in life. 17. The Ripple Effect Confucius had a student named Mo from the state of Dong. Mo was an average student but always considered himself the best. After studying for a few years, Mo asked to return home, believing he had learned all he could from his teacher. Tsu Kung, witnessing this, inquired, Would there be any harm if he becomes an official upon returning home? Confucius, tapping his thigh, responded, Not at all. Tsu Kung asked further, What about becoming a general? Confucius, stroking his beard, replied, That would be fine. Continuing, Tsu Kung asked, What if he turns to banditry? Confucius, yawning, answered, It wouldn't be detrimental. At that moment, Tsu Kung relaxed and mentioned casually, I heard Mo is returning home just to become a teacher. Upon hearing this, Confucius was startled. He rushed out, not bothering to put on his shoes properly or button his coat, and ran as if in a panic. His students, following him, asked, Where are you going in such a hurry? Confucius, while running, said, To the state of Dang, immediately. When asked why he was heading to Dang, Confucius, still on the move, explained, To prevent Mo from becoming a teacher, if he becomes an official, at most, he could harm a village. As a general, he might harm a city. Even as a bandit, it's uncertain if he'd cause any real harm. But if he becomes a teacher, the damage could last for generations. Even I might not escape the repercussions. 18. Kindness is a virtue, but naivety is not. Human nature is fundamentally kind, it's often said, and it's this kindness that fills the world with warmth and hope. However, true kindness must be accompanied by wisdom and discernment. Without them, kindness can become folly. Once, a Zen master meditating by a river heard a commotion, only to find a scorpion struggling in the water. Compassionately, he reached out to rescue it, only to be stung. Undeterred, he gently placed the scorpion back on the ground and resumed his meditation. When the scorpion fell into the water again, the master saved it once more, enduring another sting. This cycle repeated, drawing the attention of a fisherman who asked, The scorpion keeps hurting you. Why do you continue to save it? The master replied, Stinging is its nature, but compassion is mine. As the scorpion fell in again, the master moved to save it. But this time, the fisherman used a branch to allow the scorpion to climb out by itself. The fisherman advised, Compassion is right, but first be kind to yourself. Protect yourself before extending kindness to others. Kindness is indeed a virtue, but it must be wielded with the sharpness of intellect. The human heart is complex, the world is perilous, and naive kindness can embolden the greedy and provide opportunities for the malicious, ultimately causing harm to oneself. This tale underscores the pitfalls of blind benevolence. While it's important not to lose our innate kindness amidst life's harsh realities, wise kindness doesn't mean calculating gains from our generosity. We should give with a generous heart, but also discern who truly deserves our kindness. 19. Achieving Inner Peace Through Letting Go A Zen master once stated, To achieve a mind as tranquil as water, the key is to relinquish the incessant desires for fame and fortune and to cast aside the disturbances of emotional entanglements. Thus, to accomplish this, one must learn to let go. Indeed, in a world rife with conflict, many are plagued by unrest because they place too much importance on themselves. A tranquil mind can give birth to wisdom, and such serenity is a sign of profound intelligence. In the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, there's an anecdote about Zhuge Liang's empty fort strategy during his defeat at Jiting. 
Facing Sima Yi's approaching army of 150,000 with only 2,500 soldiers to defend the city, Zhuge Liang remained undisturbed. He calmly played his zither on the city walls, accompanied only by two boys. Sima Yi, puzzled by this serene scene upon arriving at the city, hesitated and eventually ordered a retreat, intimidated by Zhuge Liang's composed demeanor. This act of maintaining composure even as Mount Tai crumbles before one's eyes or a deer dances at one's side without drawing a glance epitomizes a transcendent level of equanimity that is beyond the reach of ordinary individuals. 20. The Wealth of Kind Words There's an old saying, Wounds inflicted by swords and knives heal easily, but malicious words are hard to erase. It's essential to practice verbal virtue. If something shouldn't be said, then don't say it. And if it needs to be said, say it gently. It's often remarked, fortune enters through the mouth and disaster exits from it. The mouth can quickly create karma. In just a moment, you can offend many. On life's journey, this can lead to an increasing number of enemies and a narrowing path. If you desire a life of prosperity, let your speech be the first to reflect wealth. For a family to be blessed, conversations must be grounded in morality. Speaking with empathy, making others feel good, naturally leads to acceptance and friendship. Consider the story of a black taxi driver who transported a white mother and her child. The child asked, Why is the driver's skin different from ours? The mother, with a smile, responded, Because God wanted to fill the world with color, so he created people with different skin colors. Upon reaching their destination, the driver refused payment. When I was a child, I asked my mother a similar question. She told me we were black because we were meant to be of a lower class. If only she had answered like you did today, I might have led a different life. Speaking kind words is like sowing seeds of good karma and nurturing positive connections. Cultivating a wealth of words, speaking with compassion, not only makes it easier to forge friendships, but also ensures family harmony. Thus, blessings and prosperity will naturally follow. 21. Five Conversational Taboos for the Fortunate What the Wise Avoid Saying In Gui Guzi's Strategies of the Heavens, Gui Guzi emphasizes the importance of avoiding five detrimental states of speech when interacting with others. 1. The ill. Speaking in a lethargic and spiritless manner, lacking drive and failing to see things through, showing no ambition for progress. 2. The resentful. Prone to complaining, filled with negative energy, lacking in decisive action or solutions, and pessimistically negative. 3. The anxious. Overly emotional and sensitive, consumed by one's own world, leaving others feeling disconnected. 4. The angry. Emotions unchecked, excessive in joy and anger with provocative speech. 5. The overly joyful. Arrogantly pleased with oneself, speaking condescendingly and using careless words, which can lead to envy from others and turn happiness into sorrow. When someone constantly complains, expresses dissatisfaction, or carries negative energy without contentment, their good fortune tends to dissipate. Such an attitude leads to a lack of enthusiasm in all endeavors, a superficial approach to tasks, and ultimately, a life of dissatisfaction. A prosperous family and fulfilling life require learning to be content and mastering the art of expressing satisfaction. Just as dark clouds bring rain, reckless behavior invites disaster. It is crucial to avoid acting with unchecked arrogance or folly, as one must bear the consequences of their actions and luck. Controlling one's emotions and refraining from rash speech in any situation is key to cultivating a life of fortune, starting with the cultivation of prosperous speech.
22. Speaking with sincerity and empathy. Artful communication can turn potential conflicts into blessings, but it requires nurturing your ability to speak thoughtfully. As Gui Guzzi's Strategies of the Warring States suggests, different conversations demand different strategies. With the wise, draw on broad knowledge. With the affluent, exhibit strong, refined communication. With the less privileged, who may be more sensitive, adopt humility and politeness to touch their hearts. And when speaking with someone who has erred, offer encouragement to boost their confidence and motivation. Gui Guzzi emphasized, no one wants to be outdone by others. Effective communication isn't about parroting others, but about genuine engagement and considering issues from the other's perspective. Understanding the real thoughts and desires of others allows you to speak words that are truly beneficial to them. Guiguzi was a master of the art of persuasion, teaching his disciples, such as Zhang Yi and Su Qin, to navigate the complex political landscapes of their time, not just with eloquent speech, but more importantly, by understanding and aligning with the interests of their audiences. In interactions, what people value most is authenticity. Even the most eloquent speech cannot touch a heart as deeply as genuine emotion can. Speaking from the heart not only makes life's journey smoother, but also broadens your path. 23. The company. You keep shapes your life. Being around diligent people, you'll find laziness slipping away. Surrounded by positivity, your spirit will not falter. Walking with the wise, you won't remain ordinary. In the company of greatness, you're bound to reach the pinnacle of success. Scientists believe that humans are the only creatures capable of being influenced by suggestion. Positive suggestions can significantly impact one's emotions and physiological state, unlocking inner potential and elevating abilities beyond the average inspiring progress and eagerness to advance. It's best to distance oneself from negatively influential individuals, as they might unwittingly steal your dreams, leaving you disheartened and mediocre over time. Positive influencers are like the sun, bringing light wherever they shine. Negative ones are akin to the moon, remaining unchanged whether you meet them for the first time or after 10 years. 24. Attitude shapes everything. Your future is defined by your outlook. It's said that life's greatest fortunes include having a great teacher in school, working alongside talented colleagues and a supportive boss, and finding a life partner who truly understands and resonates with you. Sometimes, a simple smile or a warm, caring inquiry from them can brighten your entire existence. One of life's greatest misfortunes, however, is the lack of a positive influence nearby, someone with vision and breadth, this absence can render your life mediocre and dull. There's a powerful saying, who you are matters less than who you're with. The story of Mencius's mother moving their home three times to find the right environment for her son underscores the critical importance of the company you keep. An eagle raised among chickens will lose its instinct to soar. It can never fly high. Similarly, a wolf growing up among goats loses its wild nature and cannot roam the mountains and rivers freely. Even if you're exceptionally talented, being surrounded by those with a negative influence can sap your ambition, diminish your drive, and leave you settling for mediocrity. If you aspire to soar like an eagle, you must fly with eagles, not content yourself among sparrows. If you wish to roam like a wolf, you must stride with the pack, not walk among goats. 25. To be smart, surround yourself with smart people. If you consider yourself smart, then make it a point to surround yourself with smart people. It's the best way to sharpen your wit further. If you believe you're exceptional, then staying close to exceptional individuals can help you stand out even more. There's wisdom in the saying, like attracts like, 
which explains why entire dormitories can produce scholars or a single class can boast numerous successful students. Discovering a great book or befriending a mentor are two of life's greatest fortunes. The company you keep largely determines your personal worth. Being around outstanding friends not only elevates your value, but also significantly supports your career aspirations. Friendships are a lifetime's treasure because they offer support and encouragement, helping you to consistently succeed and advance without retreating. The beauty of life lies in having companions by your side. Just like when you give someone a rose, the fragrance lingers on your hand. Life operates on this principle. To be among the intelligent, you must be intelligent. To be among the exceptional, you need to be exceptional. If you cannot surround yourself with such people, then life, love, marriage, family, and career might not flourish as they potentially could. 26. The Principle of Not Defending Oneself During the Eastern Jin Dynasty, Gao Fang held the position of imperial censor in Zhejiang province, serving under the jurisdiction of Zhang Tong. At that time, a military academy student named Duan Hong Tian stole wood from the government to make household items. Zhang Tong, upon discovering this, was furious and wanted to execute Duan. In a desperate attempt to save his life, Duan falsely claimed, Gao Fang instructed me to do it. Zhang Tong then questioned Gao Fang to verify Duan's claim, and surprisingly, Gao Fang took responsibility for the act, saving Duan from the death penalty. As a result, Zhang Tong rewarded Gao Fang with 10,000 strings of cash and a horse, but then dismissed him from his position. Gao Fang left quietly, never once attempting to justify himself or rectify the false accusation. Later, Zhang Tong summoned Gao Fang back. Over a year later, a confidant of Zhang Tong revealed that Gao Fang had admitted guilt solely to save another's life. Zhang Tong was astounded by this revelation and showed Gao Fang even greater respect and generosity thereafter. 27. Finding Gold But Declining Ownership Giving money to others is not a difficult task, but showing kindness to someone infringing on your own assets is a level of magnanimity not everyone can achieve. When Zhang Ji was studying at the Imperial Academy, his family sent him 10 ounces of gold, which, unfortunately, his roommate stole while Zhang was away. The Academy authorities summoned the roommate for a search. Upon discovering the gold, Zhang Ji astonishingly claimed, This is not my gold. Taking advantage of the night's cover, the thieving roommate returned the gold to Zhang Zhai's coat pocket. Recognizing his roommate's dire straits, Zhang generously gifted half of the gold to him. Elders often say that giving gold away is something many can easily do, but Zhang's act of not claiming his rightful gold upon its recovery especially under such pressing circumstances, is a virtue that few possess. 28. Redeeming a Thief Vu Lin Gi from Tao Chao, originally a city dweller, was known for his integrity and kindness, never exploiting others for personal gain. In his later years, he enjoyed a relatively prosperous life. One night, a thief broke into his home, who turned out to be the son of a neighbor. When Vu Lingi's sons caught the thief, Vu asked the young man, You've never been known to do wrong. Why resort to stealing in the dead of night? The thief confessed, Out of sheer desperation and poverty, I had no choice. When asked what he needed, the thief mentioned that 10,000 coins would suffice to cover food, drink, and clothing. Vu Lingi immediately handed him the exact amount. As the thief walked away, Vu called him back, which terrified the young man, thinking Vu had changed his mind and intended to turn him in. Vu reassured him, carrying such a sum might raise suspicion from the night patrol. He let the thief stay until morning before safely sending him off. The thief, deeply moved by Vu's generosity and trust, 
turned his life around and became an honest citizen. Neighbors and locals hailed Vu Lin Gi as a great benefactor. He further contributed to his community by selecting promising children and establishing a school, inviting renowned teachers to educate them. Vu's son and grandson, Vu Kiet Hu, successively passed the imperial examinations, becoming distinguished scholars in southern Tao Chao. This was seen as karmic reward for Vu's virtuous deeds and his dedication to fostering goodness in his community. 29. Giving a servant a chance to start anew. Zhang Tixian, a celebrated general during the Northern Song Dynasty, initially served as a vice transport commissioner in southern Zhang before rising to prominence. During a dinner party at his home, he noticed a servant stealthily pocketing a few silver items concealing them on his person. Zhang observed this from behind a curtain but chose to remain silent. Later in life, when Zhang held the prestigious position of prime minister, many of his household staff were appointed to official positions, except for the thieving servant. Taking advantage of a quiet moment, the servant knelt before Zhang, tearfully inquiring why he, who had served the longest, was overlooked for an official appointment while newcomers were promoted. Zhang, reluctantly bringing up the past, reminded the servant of the theft in Zhang Yan, a secret he had kept for nearly 30 years, even from the servant himself. Now, as prime minister, responsible for appointing and dismissing officials, encouraging the virtuous and exposing the corrupt, how could I possibly recommend a thief for an official position? Out of respect for your long service, I am giving you 300,000 coins. Take this and find a peaceful place to live. Since I've revealed this old matter, you must feel ashamed and can no longer stay here, Zhang explained. Astonished and moved, the servant wept, expressed his gratitude, and took his leave. The ancient said, By yielding the way to others, you make your own path broader and clearer. Throughout history, those who adapt and yield when appropriate, knowing when to advance and when to retreat without contention, often gain more than they lose in life. Yielding does not signify defeat or weakness, but a profound understanding of respect, timing, and the wisdom that stepping back can open up vast new horizons. It's a mark of character, a higher intelligence, and a cultivated spirit. Those who know when to concede are truly admirable. They understand the value of letting go of personal views and interests at the right moment, paving the way for others. In letting go, they don't lose. They win the hearts of many. 30. Lessons on Pride Across Eastern and Western Cultures Pride often stems from an individual's belief in their superiority over others, whether in material or spiritual terms, sometimes without even realizing it. However, when this pride grows, it becomes dangerously counterproductive. During the spring and autumn period, the state of Qi faced a severe famine that led to numerous deaths. A wealthy man named Kiem Nyao, moved by compassion, decided to cook and distribute rice to the poor. Over time, as people from various places came to receive his rice and praised his generosity, Kiem Nyao became increasingly arrogant and disdainful towards others. One day, he encountered a man weakened by hunger and disdainfully offered him rice, saying, Hey you, come here and eat. The man, however, sternly replied, It's precisely because I refuse to accept rice from someone with your attitude that I'm in this state, and walked away, later dying of hunger. Kim Yao then regretted his actions, realizing that his arrogance had inadvertently hurt others' dignity, turning a good deed into a bad one. Arrogance not only spoils good deeds, but is also a fundamental reason for failure. The saying, know yourself and know your enemy and you will never be defeated, highlights this. Arrogant individuals center themselves, underestimating those around them and even their adversaries, 
leading to their downfall as seen in historical figures like Hong Vu and Quan Vu. Moreover, arrogance breeds dangerous prejudices, making people believe only in their experiences and perceptions, dismissing anything beyond their understanding. This narrow worldview, despite being proud of one's perceived superior intellect, is akin to a frog in a well. In Western religions, devils are often depicted as fallen angels, with pride being the primary cause of their downfall. Lucifer, once a perfect angel beside God, fell because of his pride and disobedience, leading to his rebellion in heaven and eventual transformation into Satan. Similarly, in Buddhism, Devadatta, a cousin of Buddha Shakyamuni, let his arrogance lead him to commit numerous sins, including attempting to harm the Buddha and take over the monastic community. These profound lessons from both Christianity and Buddhism, as well as from Eastern and Western cultures, underscore pride as a root of many evils. Christianity identifies seven deadly sins, with pride at the forefront, while Buddhism's Avatamsaka Sutra lists arrogance as one of the three major obstacles to spiritual practice, showing that true religions regard pride as the source of sin. In conclusion, the Tao Te Ching teaches, the highest goodness is like water. Water benefits all things without competing, and a truly good person is like water, embracing everyone with tolerance. Just as the ocean, being the lowest point, receives all rivers and becomes their king, only through humility, treating others with kindness and putting oneself last, can one control their ego and earn respect. And only by shedding personal biases can one observe the world with a rational eye, understand the true nature of things, attain profound wisdom, and become invincible in knowing oneself and others. 31. The Haunting Some mistakes, even if not acknowledged by those who make them, can still indirectly impact their world. Once, I was dining with a friend who is a chef, and he noticed something black in his food. He immediately became cautious and fished it out. Although it turned out to be just a burnt piece of onion, he couldn't bring himself to eat the dish anymore. He candidly expressed, I believe that nowadays... Many restaurants compromise integrity, with much of the food being unclean. That's why I usually avoid eating out. I'm haunted by the thought. Because he was aware of unhygienic practices in his own profession, he assumed others were the same, allowing a burnt onion to ruin his appetite. In reality, without that piece of onion, he might have enjoyed the meal just like anyone else. 32. Letting go and letting be. In life, gaining something always comes with a loss. The more you gain, the more you lose, and vice versa. It's a fair exchange. Many people dream of winning the lottery, but the reality of life after a big win often falls short of expectations. A social study followed lottery jackpot winners over 10 years to observe how their lives changed. Most winners came from working-class backgrounds and believed that money would improve their lives. However, after receiving substantial sums, their lives often took a turn for the worse. Reckless spending, family and friends borrowing money, divorces and moving houses became common. Many fell into decline because they couldn't manage their newfound wealth effectively. Everything in life has its pros and cons. Therefore, a truly wise person understands that there's no real joy in gaining nor sorrow in losing. Facing any situation in life, one can adopt the mindset of letting go and letting be, remaining unshaken and at peace, regardless of the circumstances. This scenario is not unique. Your actions can shape your worldview, engaging in dubious deeds, even if unnoticed and unpunished, and even if your conscience doesn't nag at you, breeds skepticism towards the world, indirectly unsettling your inner peace. Our inclination to do good and avoid wrong 
isn't just about seeking praise or dodging societal reprimand. More fundamentally, our actions resonate within us. The greatest reward for good deeds lies in the joy and contentment of our souls, while the harshest penalty for wrongdoing is the gnawing of conscience and inner turmoil. 33. The Meal and Personal Growth First Story Xiao Ming was invited to a job interview at a major company. Throughout the interview, he stood out impressively and was invited by the CEO to a dinner party. At the party, Xiao Ming believed he behaved impeccably. However, he was not the one offered the job. Frustrated, he suspected foul play. Eventually, the recruitment team informed him that while he was indeed talented, the manager decided against hiring him because, during the dinner party, which was also a part of the interview process, Xiao Ming did not show any gratitude towards the serving staff. Second Story On the eve of Lunar New Year, Mai Mai's parents came to Beijing to celebrate with their daughter. Her boyfriend quickly arranged a dinner at a familiar restaurant. Throughout the meal, he tried hard to impress. However, Mai Mai's parents felt he wasn't up to their standards for three reasons. He made the restaurant reservations without consulting Mai Mai or considering her parents' preferences. He was impatient and rude to the serving staff during the dinner rush, and he spent over 10 minutes on a phone call during the meal, leaving Mai Mai's parents feeling awkward and ignored. After hearing her parents' feedback, Mai Mai began to reassess. Third story. The way a man treats serving staff before marriage is indicative of how he will treat his wife after marriage. This statement might seem extreme, but whether it's a business dinner or a family meal, how you treat the serving staff not only reflects your manners and cultivation, but also hints at your emotional life. A psychologist once wrote, Constant criticism and nitpicking towards serving staff can slow down service. A person with emotional intelligence would say, You look so pretty and efficient. I'm sure you can bring our dishes out quicker, right? Thank you so much. Fourth story. What you bring to others in such moments is the ability to diffuse situations gracefully. Consider others' feelings to ensure everyone enjoys their meal, checking if the dishes suit everyone's taste and if the seating is comfortable. An etiquette teacher once shared that her mother taught her to synchronize eating pace with guests. A host should not put down their chopsticks while the guest is still enjoying their meal, as it might make the guest feel uneasy to continue eating. Thoughtfulness and attention to detail in every aspect of dining etiquette and attitude can bring not only good manners but also good fortune. 34. A Strong Foundation Water flows to the very end until it cascades down a waterfall, just as people, when pushed to their limits, can find rebirth. In moments of despair, one should not hastily give up. Just one more step might lead into a field of blooming flowers. A bit more endurance could bring joyful scenery. A friend once mentioned he was planning to write a novel about a bank heist something quite fanciful and far-fetched. I suggested, why not write a love story? I'd love to read a romance penned by you. He replied, I've lost faith in love. How could I possibly write about it? Love just leads to despair. I countered, that's perfect. You're now in the ideal state to write a love story. It's known that Many top comedians are quite serious, even dull in their personal lives, finding little amusement in existence. Yet, they can produce the most hilarious performances. Similarly, a renowned female director who is actually terrified of blood and darkness creates films that chill viewers to the bone with their graphic violence. It makes one wonder if she closes her eyes while filming such scenes. Despair isn't necessarily bad. Sometimes, it's the turning point for a new life chapter. A person who has despaired in love must have endured a painful past. A great writer's love stories are not just about romance, but life and humanity at their core. 
Longing for love motivates us to leave our past behind and move forward. If we were immortal, would our love remain as passionate? Fate isn't just about random luck. It's about embracing and overcoming the limitations of our finite existence. Making choices within these constraints is true freedom. We're free to love and to despair. Love starts with fascination and often ends in despair, but those who've despaired may see things more clearly. O. Henry's short story, The Last Leaf, tells of a patient, bedridden and despondent, who becomes fixated on a single green leaf on a barren tree outside her window, believing her life would end when the leaf fell. Day after day, she watched it, waiting for both the leaf and her life to drop. Yet, the leaf remained, even as she regained her health. In reality, no leaves were left on the tree. The last leaf was a painting by an elderly artist, not a real leaf, but one that offered her the firm belief to keep living. As long as that leaf stayed, she felt her life would continue. Ultimately, she recovered and discovered the truth about the leaf, deeply moved by the silent support of the artist who knew her deepest fears and hopes. The real lifesaver wasn't the leaf, but the unwavering faith it instilled in her. 35. Keeping a Kind Heart Don't let money dictate how you treat others, nor allow personal gain to cause harm. Avoid deceitful tactics and the inclination to oppress those around you. Embrace simplicity over complexity, kindness over cruelty, and honesty over deception. Show reverence to your parents, loyalty to your friends, cherish your partner, and enthusiasm towards your colleagues. Treat everyone with kindness, care for those close to you, and always leave room for grace in your actions and decisions. When giving to others, do so with compassion. When rewarding, let it be with benevolence. A cheerful spirit brings its own rewards, always staying close by. By maintaining a positive intent and speaking kindly, you can forge good relationships with others, creating a circle of positive influence and mutual respect. 36. True Happiness the greatest tragedy in life is living amidst happiness without recognizing it, always seeking fulfillment elsewhere, which only leads to exhaustion. It's only upon loss that one realizes the extent of their prior contentment. Recently, I had a casual conversation with a friend who shared about her mother. Coming from a relatively affluent family with a 100-square-meter home, her mother was never satisfied always envying others' mansions, leading to a life of constant discontent and complaints to her children and grandchildren. She believed true luxury meant living like others. Her son, in an attempt to fulfill his mother's dream of owning a mansion, invested all he had into a business that unfortunately failed, leaving them financially strained and forced to sell their home resulting in living in a mere 10 square meter space. This is a classic case of not realizing the happiness one lives in due to overwhelming desires. This reminds me of the tale of the grateful goldfish. To repay the old fisherman who saved its life, the fish granted all his wife's wishes, from a new wooden basin to a large house. Yet, her desires grew unbounded from wanting to become a lady of nobility to a queen, but it was never enough. Eventually, the goldfish ceased to care and their lives reverted to their original state. This story illustrates the endless nature of human desire. One day, I stumbled upon a saying online, Life is inherently happy. It's just that people are never satisfied. If carrying burdens is suffering, then doing nothing is happiness. If walking is suffering, then riding a donkey is happiness. If hunger and cold are suffering, then being well-fed and warm is happiness. True happiness is found in contentment, a sentiment many agree with, yet few manage to live by. Another story that resonated with me was The Poor Man and the Angel, 
where a poor man living in cramped conditions with four generations under one roof prays for an escape from his misery. The angel instructs him to bring chickens and ducks inside his home for a week. After enduring a week of chaos, he pleads with the angel again, who then advises him to let the animals out and return after another week. Gratefully kneeling before the angel, the man now feels truly happy. Many of us are like the poor man, complaining about life's injustices, feeling inferior compared to others, and believing everyone else's life is better. However, happiness is often right beside us, unnoticed. The angel didn't grant the poor man anything new. Instead, he taught him to appreciate what he had, focusing not on what's lacking but on what's present. It's not that life is unfair. It's our excessive desires that blind us to our existing happiness. Only when faced with adversity do we reminisce about the past and realize that simplicity was happiness all along. Instead of constantly seeking happiness while already living in it, we should embrace our path and enjoy our lives. Time is never wasted. It helps us recognize the value of what we've lost, teaching us to cherish our present lives more deeply.